welcome to another edition of Let's Talk Criterion, a channel exclusively previewing forthcoming releases from the Criterion Collection, and in this edition we'll be looking at another three Janus contemporary releases, beginning with the Cannes award-winning 2022 drama written and directed by Belgian directors Luc Dardenne and Jean-Pierre Dardenne. Now this film won the special 75th anniversary prize last year at Cannes. It stars Pablo Schills as Tori and Mabundo Iwele as Lokita. 11-year-old Tori and 16-year-old Lokita live by their wits in a Belgian city, posing as a brother and a sister. Now the two hang out at the restaurant of Betim. He's a man who uses his business to cover up a drug ring they courier for, and sometimes pays Lokita for sexual favours. Lokita is trying to obtain a work visa with which she could support herself and Tori, but she also has to deal with the debt contracted with the people who brought her into Belgium, and think about the mother and the five brothers she left behind in Cameroon. When Lokita's papers are rejected yet again, she accepts the team's offer to go to work for a while locked up in a hangar tending cannabis plantations. But she has to be separated from Tori without even being able to call him on the phone, which is unbearable for both of them. Now it's not quite firmly established whether they're actually related at all, but it's clear they behave like they are. They totally rely on each other, and they're torn to be apart. Lokita also has what appears to be panic attacks when she's under stress. Now the storytelling from the Dardens here tears at your heartstrings as the two young protagonists struggle against insufferable odds. Theirs is a futility about the mission to get Lokita her all-important documents and to remain in Belgium and lead a normal life as a home help and to live in an apartment with Tori. At least that's her dream. But it's obvious it's not going to happen, and the stakes ramp up as the film progresses, and you begin to admire Tori's streetwise intelligence, and the fact that he will be the one that endures, because he's smarter than Lokita. She's the weaker of the two, she cannot endure. Her desperation under the situation is palpable, and the humanity forces the viewer to really fear for her safety, and for the safety of the abandoned Tori on the outside. The Dardens create an interesting dynamic here by deliberately separating the two after you've seen them so close together earlier in the film. Now the lead performances are extraordinary, they're so real in the manner of so many gifted and relatively young and experienced performers who haven't yet had the spontaneity crushed out of them by the cliches given of formal training. And of course, as often the case with the Dardens, the hand held up close acting, driven filmmaking puts you in the middle of the drama to sometimes a nerve-wracking degree, although with a bit less shakiness than you would have seen in the earlier features, like uh, for instance uh, the digital cameras they used, they may have brought understated elegance to their previous rough and tumble style. For instance, there might be fewer than a hundred shots in the entire film, and the scenes tend to unfold in just one take or it appears so, which would be impressive no matter who the actors were, but that is especially noteworthy here considering that the two leads aren't known quantities. A long take in the middle of the movie that follows physically and emotionally intense action through the halls and rooms of Batim's drug greenhouse lasts for almost five minutes, but is executed with such offhand confidence you would never think of it as a logistical feat. This feeling of you being an onlooker is where the real strength of this film lies, and the supporting performances adding to the strength, but they do so almost inconsequentially, mainly acting as barriers to Tori and Lokita's onward progress to their end objective. But the lead actors bring audiences inside each moment so skillfully you can intuit flashes of context the script may not have necessarily provided, and the Dardenne's empathy is so great and their anger at the situation is so unmistakable that the entire film is borne along by a desire to shock viewers into calling for change. Tori and Lakita's cast is small and it's as follows. Pablo Schills as Tori, Mamudu Weli as Lokita, Charlotte Buin as Margot, Chimien Govertz as Lucas, Alban Yukaj as Petim and Mark Zinga as Furman. Tori and Lukita has a running time of 89 minutes, and it's a widescreen presentation. Now there are only two special features on this disc. They are Meet the Filmmakers, a new interview with the directors Jean-Pierre and Luc Dardenne, and a film trailer. 
and the film releases through Criterion Collection on Tuesday the 21st of November and it's certainly a must watch and for UK viewers you can see it, it's already available in the UK on Blu-ray through Picture House Distribution. Our next release is quite a contrast, it's The It Mountains. It's a 2022 drama film co-directed by Felix van Grinigen and Charlotte van der Meesch, and it's co-adapted uh, the screenplay from the novel of the same name by Paolo Cognetti. Now this film depicts a friendship between two men who spend their childhood together in a remote alpine village and reconnect later as adults. Now the title is a reference to the concept in Buddhism and the ancient Italian cosmology that the world is composed of nine mountains and eight seas, specifically eight concentric circular mountain ranges separated from one another by eight seas, with the ninth and the tallest mountain, that's Mount Muru, at the centre. The filmmakers became friends with the writer Paolo Cognetti and invited him to be a full collaborator during the making of the film. The cast really appreciated this and consulted him throughout the shoot, and that took place in the Italian Alps, Turin and Nepal over several months, beginning in the summer of 2021. The story ranges over a period of about 30 years. Two young teenage boys meet as one boy's family holidays in the area, and throughout an 80s summer they become friends. Pietro is from a city and Bruno is a farmer's son and is very much born to the country life. The two, although from different backgrounds, develop a strong bond. Bruno's father is a simple man and has a very narrow view of Bruno's life. He is to farm for the rest of his life and not get an education, despite in many respects proving to be more intelligent than Pietro. Pietro's father works away a lot of the time and acts as a mentor to Pietro, who is close to him in his formative years. But there is a superb scene in the film where he takes the two boys to a glacier, but Pietro cannot hack the climb. That day for Pietro is a turning point, and he then grows to resent his father and to inevitably distance himself. The same happens with his summer friend Bruno, and they don't see each other for 15 years. Now this film is one of her relationships and how strong a bond of friendship can actually be. Despite the fact lives diverge, friends in this case relink and their bond is even stronger in older, more mature years. No one can predict how your life can unfold, especially in your formative years. This is subtly directed with the young Pietro and Bruno giving excellent performances, but the older Pietro and Bruno are very impressive indeed. Pietro now with a larger view of the world, but still happy to assist his friend to build his dream house nestled in the depth of the mountains, and Bruno is quiet with his lot in life, and with no real aspirations, but only to exist and connect with his mountainous home. Now the cinematography is quite stunning, the directors having chosen to shoot it in an academy aspect ratio, and not take advantage of a widescreen perspective, they've used drones and helicopters for the aerial shots, including one amazing zoom out from Pietro climbing down the snowy slopes, showing the sheer scale. The long two and a half hour running time allows the film to unfold gently and tell the story and show the passage of time, and especially Pietro's absences from Bruno and his small family as it goes to the other side of the world, to Nepal, which he is strongly drawn to. The soundtrack to the film consists almost entirely of songs written by Swedish singer-songwriter Daniel Norgren, and his songs are interspersed throughout the film, adding a nice flavour. The film had its world premiere in competition at the 75th Cannes Film Festival on the 18th of May last year. It had a limited theatrical release in the USA by Janus Films on 28th of April 2023, and in France on the 21st of December 2022. Italy was the following day. The film was warmly welcomed at the Cannes Film Festival, where it took the joint Prix de Jury prize with EO in 2022, and it's also available to watch on physical media in the UK on Blu-ray via Picture House Distribution, who seem to be picking up a lot of the Janus contemporary releases this year. Now the cast of the It Mountains consists of Lupo Barrerio as young Pietro, Andrea Palma as adolescent Pietro, Luca Marinelli as the older Pietro, Cristiano Sassella as the young Bruno, Francesco Palombere as the adolescent Bruno, Alessandro Borghi as the older Bruno, Filipino Timi as Giovanni, that's Pietro's father, 
Elena Liete as Francesca, that's Pietro's mother, Elisabetta Mazzullo as Lara, Bruno's companion, and Sorascia Panta as Asmi, that's Pietro's girlfriend he meets in Nepal. If you want to soak up a beautifully realised film about relationships and being tied strongly to a place, then The Eight Mountains would be a film I would recommend. Its travel over its running time is slow, there is no action, it's just a gentle Sunday afternoon watch showing the platonic love and connection to place and self between two men across many years, and it will certainly uplift you with all that's going on in the world at present. There are places of sanctuary and transcendence, and these men appear to have discovered them, and more importantly, they're there for each other. The special features on the disc again are few. They are Meet the Filmmakers, that's a new interview with directors Charlotte van der Meersch and Felix van Grinigen, and The Making of the Eight Mountains, that's a new documentary featuring cast and crew, and of course there is a trailer. And The Eight Mountains is released on Tuesday the 21st of November in 4x3 aspect ratio, it's a running time of 147 minutes, and is distributed through the Criterion Collection in the US. And now we come to our third, and perhaps our most challenging watch from the Janus Contemporaries, and it's directed by an Icelandic director, Hilnor Palmason. It's set in the late 1800s, and it's called Godland. Now, the film stars Elliot Krosethov as Lucas, a Lutheran priest from Denmark, who is sent to Iceland to oversee the establishment of a new parish church, only to have his faith tested and challenged by the harsh conditions of rural life, including his inability as a monolingual Danish language speaker to communicate with his assigned Icelandic guide, Ragnar, played in the film by Ingvar Egert Zergersen. Now, the film premiered at the 2022 Cannes Film Festival on the 24th of May, and was nominated for many and won several awards in 2022, including the Gold Hugo for Best Feature Film at the Chicago Film Festival. Now, the opening of the film has a title card that states a box was found in Iceland with seven wet plate photographs taken by a Danish priest. Now, these images are the first photographs of the southeast coast. This film is inspired by these photographs. However, the images never existed. Hilner invented them to help inspire the filmmaking process. Now, it's both an epic saga of landscape cinema and a terrifying philosophical voyage. If God exists, why would he be sending a young fool like Lucas to do his bidding? Pastor Lucas is full of a desire to save souls in this God-forsaken corner of Denmark's empire, but under equipped for the task, he's rigid, arrogant and pious, and is a bad combination. In that time, Denmark was the authority and had colonial rule over Iceland, before it got its independence. The religious figure was usually seen in a position of authority and therefore to be obeyed. However, Lucas fails to establish this from the outset, even with his guide, Ragnar, because of the language barrier that exists between them. His experience of life has come largely from books and his rampant self-regard, and in short, he's like a lot of the young priests who went out to the colonies during Christianity's messianic missionary phase, where they often floundered. He wants to do it the hard way, sailing to the west coast and walking across country so that he can get to know it. An old priest warns him that it will not be easy. These people are different. You will have to adapt. You will need the strength of an apostle to succeed. Now, he makes it even harder to endure by taking a large camera and lots of boxes of materials for which to take photographic exposures. Now, this is mirroring the fictional photos on which the film is based. He takes photographs along the journey and very nearly kills himself. The language barrier between him and his guide leads to some pent-up resentment. He cannot understand anything the guide says. He finally gets to the small hamlet in which he's setting up his parish church, and he's welcomed there by Carl, played by Jakob Holberg Lohmann, who is a fellow Dean, and his two daughters, Anna and Ida, they give him a meal, and the eldest daughter, Anna, sings to him. Their father, Carl, thinks him decidedly odd, though, to have not chosen the easiest course, which is to sail. Lucas is the proverbial fish out of water here, having forgotten the bishop's advice altogether. For the mission to be a success, he must adapt to the locals and their customs, and no less than his life is on the line here. Godland is deliberately shot in a photo-style frame. 
Palmerston is usually viewing his characters also through other frames within the film, and this creates a feeling of always looking in, like you are behind the camera, and the whole scene could suddenly freeze so a perfect image could be captured. Iceland looks beautiful, but is also showing its cold and unwelcoming side, and this is reflected in the detached nature of the young priest and many of the hamlet's inhabitants. All this is enormously rich material to work with, rendered all the more engaging by the surroundings, but Palmerston doesn't make Godland easy on audiences. The film can feel as alien as its characters, and its place grim like a Lutheran church service, demanding reflection. Palmerston is an artist with an almost unique sense of pacing, devoting months if not years to capturing a single image in a single location as he did, for instance, in A White White Day. There's a time-lapse element here as the filmmaker features an overhead shot of a decomposing horse, which Palmerston actually shot over years as a time-lapse. Palmerston also shows the struggle between the two lands, Denmark and Iceland, by showing the title card for the film in both languages, emphasising their historic struggle and their lack to see each other's point of view. That the main protagonist, Lucas, is also about to experience. It stands to reason that a director with such patience doesn't tell breakneck stories, but instead he chooses his audiences to lean in and engage with the project's strange and sometimes taxing rhythms. He's a cinematic original whose voice grows stronger with each film he makes, and God, as they say, is in the details. Now the features again on Godland are few. There's Meet the Filmmakers, that's a new interview with the director Hildenor Palmerson, and a trailer. Godland is a transfixing journey into the heart of colonial darkness, and it's one that's attuned to both the majesty and terrifying power of the natural world. It's long, it's 143 minutes, and filmed in Academy Ratio, and it's distributed through the Criterion Collection and releases on Tuesday the 21st of November. And if you're living in the UK, Godland has a UK release on Blu-ray via Curzon. There we go, three interesting releases there, and in the next edition, and the final one for November, we'll be looking at La Cénomonie, directed by Claude Jabrol. Until then, from me, it's goodbye, and above all, good criterion viewing.